OK, can people hear me if I don't use the mic? Are you OK at the back? Sure. Yep, thank you. Um, so thanks very much for the opportunity to present. And we want to talk about some work that we've been doing with people who have aphasia. And I'll tell you a bit about what that is. And we're from City University, London. Um, so just to start with, um, it's worth reflecting on the size of the population of people who have disabilities. Um, so when we talk about people who have a disability, we're not talking about, you know, a tiny corner of society. We're talking about a major slug of society. We're talking about, in the UK, 11 million people, nearly 12 million people, in fact. And, and of course, this changes. So a lot of people here don't have a disability, maybe, but we might have later in life. So this is a big population. It's already a big population. It could be all of us. Uh, in terms of uh, prevalence in the UK, it's worth breaking that down. And you can see that we've got, uh, in that 11 million, we've got uh, uh, nearly half who are working age, uh, uh, nearly half again, roughly half who are over pension age, and of course, a smaller number who are children. Um, so this is a large population of people uh, who are living amongst us and who are us. And it's worth then further reflecting on how, what that population consists of. Here are some breakdown figures about the types of disabilities that are represented in our population. And we flagged communication. You can see that 2.2 million people in the UK are living with a communication impairment. So again, this is a large number of people, people who have varying types of communication problems. So they're, they're major users. They're people who are going to be using material. They're, they're a big market. They're going to be buying stuff. Uh, they are people who we should be interested in. Now, one of the, the communication difficulty that we want to say a little bit about is aphasia. Uh, aphasia is a language impairment. And it's one that's caused by brain injury. So if you have, most typically the, the cause is a stroke. If you have a stroke that affects the left side of your brain, you are vulnerable to getting aphasia. And in fact, indeed, about a third of all strokes, the survivors will have aphasia. So this, again, this is a big population. Uh, we think that there are about 300,000 people living in the UK with aphasia. So it's a large group of people. And it's, aphasia is a very devastating uh, impairment. It's something that affects all aspects of your language. So yes, it affects your speech. If you have aphasia, you'll find it difficult to talk. But you will also have effects likely in your understanding of speech and in your reading and writing. So you can see already what the usability issues are going to be that come out of that. One of the things I want to, though, underscore is that people with aphasia are very variable. So Gerald is one individual, one person who has aphasia, who exemplifies aspects of aphasic difficulties. But each different person has different problems. So you might meet a different person with aphasia who perhaps has more fluent speech, but perhaps they make a lot of speech errors and they don't make a lot of sense. Or you meet some people with aphasia who can't say anything at all. And some people with aphasia who can only say perhaps one word, which they say over and over again. So there's very great variation in speech. Just often, not always, but often people with aphasia might have some degree of pronunciation difficulty. You heard that with, with Gerald saying exactly he struggled with that word. So that can occur as well, but not necessarily. You get reading and writing problems. Again, they vary. Some people can read a bit. Some people can't read at all. Some people can read much better, perhaps, than they can uh, write. Some people can write more than they speak, but still might struggle. So we've got this fantastic variability. The other thing which is very striking in aphasia is the comprehension problem. So if you explore people's understanding, very often you will see that although they're understanding speech to some degree, there is also some degree of impairment. So with Gerald, his understanding of language is a relative strength. It's a lot better than his capacity to produce it. But again, if you were to test him and to present him with some very complex language that he has to understand, he might well struggle. 
Now, Gerald doesn't, I think, show example of cognitive difficulties. You know, he's very switched on. He's orientated. He knows things. He can remember. He can solve problems. So to demonstrate that he can read to some extent, he thinks, ah, oh, if I can get hold of a newspaper, I could show what I mean here. So he's got that kind of problem-solving skill. That isn't necessarily in place for every stroke survivor, because for some stroke survivors, there may also be cognitive and organizational difficulties. So all of that means that people with aphasia face a, a thumping problem of digital exclusion. If, you've, if you present them with some sort of uh, uh, digital material like this, a page like this will present all sorts of challenges, understanding the language that's there, navigating that kind of messy, biz, busy, confusing display, uh, trying to track information or something like that is going to be very difficult. A lot of material online, this is our own lovely City University website, is very text heavy. And not only is it very text heavy, when you look closely at the language that's being used, you realize that that's really high level language. So you've got things like um, uh, pioneering research. Somebody with aphasia would struggle with those terms. Uh, I think somewhere there it talks about blue sky thinking. Blue sky thinking, very metaphorical language. Okay, somebody with aphasia might well understand the word blue, but not necessarily in that context. So that sort of material is going to be very challenging for people with aphasia. Uh, interesting overlaps with some of the issues around children. And I think that's probably where I hand over because I've hopefully set the scene for you, introduced you to what aphasia is, what the challenges might be. So Steph's going to take it on from there to talk about the issues of digital design. Great. Thanks, Jane. If I don't use the microphone, can you hear me at the back? Yes. Good. OK. <laughs> OK, so I want to build on what... Jane has said and get you to think a bit about what the challenges are for UX design when our users are people who have a language impairment like aphasia. And really I want you to think about two things. Perhaps the most obvious thing that we often think about when we talk about accessibility is how do we create designs that are accessible to people? So how do we design for people with aphasia? But I'd like to bring into the equation the first question here, which is how do we involve people with aphasia in design because we want to do that in order to do the second bit. If we can involve people in the design process, then surely we've got a better chance of having a good outcome in, in terms of creating accessible designs. Um, so this is not just about making the design accessible, it's about making the design process accessible to people who have language impairments. And I think that's something we don't think about as often perhaps as we should as designers. Okay, so Suddenly, when we're talking about people who have a language impairment like aphasia, all those techniques, all those UX techniques that you like to use, go out the window. They're just not going to work. So how do you do a think aloud with somebody who has got no spoken language? How do you set a task scenario, present them with a task scenario? How do you talk to somebody or give them a questionnaire? In fact, you might give a questionnaire a bit like some of the ones that you showed, purely visual. Suddenly, we have to start to think about what techniques we can use with people in order to facilitate their participation in design. So things like this, you know, if we like affinity diagrams, well, that's not going to work for somebody who, who, who struggles to read and who struggles with the organisation of information. So I want to say a little bit about what we've done in terms of uh, making the design process accessible and making designs accessible, digital products accessible, in the context of a particular project that we've been engaged in at City. And this is the project that's created a multi-user virtual world, which we call Eva Park. And it's created this multi-user virtual world for people who have aphasia. The idea behind it is that we would create a virtual world where people could practice their speech. So that was the end goal. So we were a multidisciplinary team. I was from the technology side. Jane was from the speech and language therapy side. We were charged with creating the platform. And then Jane and some of her colleagues were wanting to explore how people used it for practicing their speech. So what I want to focus on is the process of creating an accessible multi-user virtual world for people who have a language impairment. So it looks a bit like this. So it's a multi-user world where people represented as avatars can meet and a person with aphasia can meet a speech and language therapist and practice talking. So that's the project that I'm kind of using as a case study. So what did we do in design here? 
And I want to just give you a few little snippets of some of the techniques that we used when creating this multi-user virtual world uh, and how we kind of tried to get techniques that, we, that would enable people with aphasia to participate in a co-design, co-creation process. And we had to think quite carefully how people who had relatively little speech could participate. So one of the things that we used quite successfully were photo diaries. So instead of asking people about their needs, instead of asking them about the communication situations that they find challenging and might like to practice, we asked them to take photos on their phones or on a camera. So as they went about their everyday lives, they were to take photographs of situations in which communication was challenging and in which they might want to practice those communication skills in a virtual world. And we then later used those photographs in workshop sessions as a focus, a very tangible focus for conversations about people's communication needs and about how a practice in a virtual world might help. And alongside that, we used a technique which we called a story grid. So it, this story grid, which I'll show you in the next slide, maps out a communication space. It's a space, again, a very tangible visual space that we use to describe user needs. So let's just take a quick look. A bit messy, but what we see is a grid. And uh, down the left-hand side, we see a number of different uh, kinds of communication situations. So the top one says quiet environment, individual environment. And the, uh, this one here says a noisy group environment. And then across the top, we've got easy, sort of OK, and difficult. And we then use this as a, as a very physical artifact that people could place the photographs that they've taken, or sketches, or words, to indicate how challenging they find communication in these particular situations. So we were using this to elicit requirements in, in a very tangible way for the, uh, for the uh, virtual world that we were trying to develop. Uh, we took this notion of tangibility even further when it came to creating uh, avatars for the virtual world. So, uh, sort of inspired by the idea of paper dressing up dolls, we basically laminated lots and lots of body parts, heads, uh, your favorite hairstyle, your favorite clothes. So people could build their avatars by just selecting the body parts that they liked, the fashions that they liked, and then a member of the team would actually create the avatar for using in Eva Park. And this, I think, really uh, uh, captures the, the whole notion of tangibility and how important it was for every design technique that we used to think about how we could get away from the, the verbal, whether it was spoken or written, and use visual things and use physical things and use the placement of those things as a way of eliciting either input to the design process or indeed feedback about designs once we created them. So uh, again, when it comes to things like user testing, people weren't able to give a think aloud, but we were still able to watch what they did. And then when we wanted to ask them afterwards about their experience, we would present them with screenshots of various parts of the system and get them to rate how they felt about it using a thumbs up and thumbs down rating scale or smiley faces. But having those physical uh, uh, triggers as a focus for the user testing and as a focus for feedback sessions was really important. And then thinking a little bit more about making the design accessible, well, there's quite a lot of accessibility guidelines out there, which, which I'm sure at least some of you are very familiar with. But when you start to look at them, most of the accessibility guidelines are not focused on making technology accessible to the kinds of people that we were working with. And they're certainly not really concerned with aphasia and language impairments. Um, in January last year, the W3C uh, produced a great report talking about um, cognitive accessibility user research, uh, which hasn't uh, really manifested into uh, design guidelines as such. But here, I, I thought this quote was a, a really important quote from it. It says, it's clear that those who have considerable communication disorders with minimal, minimal literacy skills will have difficulty accessing web pages and coping with navigation within and between sites. And then they go on to say that there are considerable gaps that need to be bridged. And they go on to identify what some of those ga gaps are, things like navigation, clutter on pages. Um, so, so some of the things that uh, you need to think about when you're doing interaction design. And, and yet, we don't really have a very good set of uh, what we might call accessibility guidelines for people with a language impairment like aphasia. There are some other useful resources that we can call upon when we're thinking about the design, getting the design right. Uh, for example, the Stroke Association has produced this brilliant document which 
is focused on really making uh, printed uh, content accessible to people with language impairments, but I think is very applicable if you're thinking about the, con uh, the uh, online content on websites. Um, so if you're not aware of this, I think it's something that anybody who's got a, uh, an interest in accessibility really should have a look at. And, and they've got five, what they call their five steps to making, con or to making information accessible. Uh, first of all, keeping messages short. Secondly, clear sentences. Third, using easy words, which is something that, that uh, uh, picks up on what Jane said. Uh, fourth, the importance of good layout. And then step five, make a set, which basically means start again, do the same thing for your next message, so go through the whole process iteratively. And if you look at this document, this report, you'll find it provides lots of uh, detailed guidance about how to do each of these steps and, great, and some great examples as well. So that's something that can give us a handle on how to make content accessible, but doesn't tell us very much about how to make the interaction ac accessible. Um, and so some of the, find, the things that we've discovered through the work on Eva Park, and indeed earlier work on technology for people who have aphasia, is some of the guidance that I've, I've put on this slide. And this is some of the things I think that we need to be thinking about going forward uh, in terms of uh, creating accessible, product, accessible digital products for people's language impairments. So for example, we find it's really important to make sure that systems are not distracting, that if you want somebody to do something, there shouldn't be other clutter, there shouldn't be other calls to action, uh, or buttons or navigation or unnecessary elements on a screen that is distracting people's attention. Secondly, a lot of people with uh, aphasia uh, also have some degree of difficulty uh, remembering things. So it's often very useful to uh, provide reminders on a screen about what you can do next in a way that you wouldn't necessarily do for people who don't have this particular impairment. So if you think about a screen, you think about always having visible the actions that you can do in that screen rather than having them hidden in some way. The minimal use of language is a complete no-brainer. I mean, this is obviously one of the first things you want to think about is taking some of the language, some of the unnecessary language out of the interface, and if where there is language and where there is content, going back to something like the Stroke Association's guidelines in order to understand how best to deliver it. Um, a fourth uh, finding that we've uh, discovered and tried to apply in our work is the importance of not having complex sequences of actions. Uh, and we've called this direct mapping. So for example, a single click on a keypad causes an action in a, in a virtual world. You don't have to use a mouse to select a whole series of things from pull down menus or dialog boxes or something in order to make something happen. But one action on a physical input device immediately causes an obvious action in the product or the, or the system that you're working with. Um, and again, all of these different things seem to work together to help make the interaction that bit more accessible to people who have aphasia. So what does this mean in terms of our uh, work on Eva Park? Well, as I said, we were developing a virtual world where people could practice their speech. It looks a bit like this, so there are sort of uh, nice looking spaces, a slightly crazy looking disco. There are what we call functional places, so places where people can go and practice those conversations that they might need to have in the real world. In this case, having a haircut, and I think that is Jane sitting, having her, her hair <laughs> done, <laughs> cut and blow dry today. Um, or you can practice having a conversation in a restaurant, ordering a coffee and cakes, pizza, something like that. But there are and there are social spaces, so that's uh, two people at the bar. Um, there are, is a, a sort of a story theme going on about electing a mayor for this virtual world, so people can practice having a conversation about the mayor, and would you vote for Bogus Beefeater as mayor? Well, he wasn't a very popular candidate, perhaps you can gather that from his appearance. <laughs> In fact, none of the candidates were very popular, to be honest. But anyway, so we had this election theme going on. Um, we had sort of quirky, fantastical elements to provoke interesting, quirky conversations. Uh, so we had a TARDIS, we had elephants, uh, giraffes, and uh, you can just see on the top right the bottom of a tree house, which was somewhere where people could go and sit. But in terms of what we did to make this interaction accessible, 
Well, first of all, what we tried to do was take as much language away from the interface as possible. So we've tried to not have a lot of words there. Um, we've tried to make sure that people could see what interactions are available. So you probably can't see it here, but there's a little dollop on top of that elephant that says sit. So you can see the things you can interact with. We, we found that we had to mark or indicate everything that was in, interactive in the world. So anything you can interact with has a little marker on it, telling people that this is something you can interact with, not relying on them finding it or remembering. Um, we've created a set of, kind of heads-up displays, little icons for uh, things that people can do. Again, they're always visible, so you can always see, you're always reminded of what is there and what you can do at any point in time. Um, and, uh, and again, the visual, they're not using lots of language. And, we, and, um, and, we, and then we've tried to take everything else that we didn't need away from the screen, so you can just concentrate on your avatar, meeting somebody else, and practicing your speech in the world. Um, you, I, I realize you can't read this, and I didn't expect that you would be able to read it, but what we wanted to uh, show by including this is that when we looked at how people were being successful in the world, what we have here is a whole series of different tasks you can do in the world. And up here we've had the data from 20 people who've used Eva Park. And what we did was we watched them using it. Uh, we just videoed them using it. And then we looked at those videos to, to, to identify what things they could do. So we tried to identify all the, set, the full set of tasks you could possibly do in the world. And then look to see where people were being successful and where they were not being so successful. Um, and what we found was that uh, people were typically being successful in the very straightforward interaction tasks that just involved a single action on a keypad. And we gave people a very specialized keypad. They didn't have to use a standard keyboard. And so pressing an arrow on this specialized keyboard would move your avatar around. So for example, everybody was successful at navigating their avatar with this very direct uh, navigation scheme. OK, so finally, just to wrap up, um, we also collected some views from people who've experienced Eva Park, uh, some very nice comments that people made. So for example, cut and dye day's hair, drunk, uh, played in the diving board, had pizza, had band. So that's somebody's view of his experience in Eva Park. Or if Eva Park wasn't there, I wouldn't be doing what I do, talk to everyone, going out as well. Went to a club of my own two weeks ago, never done that before. So we've tried to gather some data about how successful we've been in, trying, in delivering an accessible virtual world. Um, and just to finish, um, I've got a brief bit of video, is that OK? So this is one of the people who's used Eva Park. And what we can see is him having, using his little keypad here to navigate. And up here we see his avatar and the person he was practicing conversation with. Off we go. So he's going to teleport to somewhere else. Can you still hear me? I'm here, but I can't see. Oh, I'm here. Uh, I know you are. Well, I keep wanting to face that way. Okay, I can see now. Okay, so uh, Ian has aphasia, obviously, so he has some trouble with his speech, and he's meeting a conversation partner in Eva Park and being successful in, very successful navigating around it using his keyboard. Okay, so finally, to sum up, um, I think what we've been able or tried to uh, convey today is that people with a language impairment like aphasia can face significant digital exclusion. And that in order to uh, reduce the barriers and, and give people better access to digital technologies, we need to think about doing certain things. We need to try to understand the problems uh, in, in more depth so that we can understand both how to facilitate participation in design and accessible uh, designed products that there's real value in co-working, so the, the, the collaboration between speech and language therapists and technology people on our project has been invaluable, and I don't think we'd have created the system we did if we'd not had that very interdisciplinary team. And that, uh, that has led us to 
create new design methods that have drawn on really techniques from, from both disciplines and have, have been very positive in enabling access to the design process uh, by people with aphasia. Thank you. How many people are actually affected by aphasia? So the estimates are that something like 360,000 people in the UK have aphasia and almost a million people in the United States. So are there different levels of it as well? Yes. So Gerald, who you saw, has got sort of severe to moderate aphasia, I would say. Um, and so he's got very limited speech although he's slightly better at reading and writing. There's some people who can't speak at all who we've worked with. Um, when the particular work in Eva Park was focused more on people who are, have got slightly more speech than Gerald has and who will benefit from practicing talking and hopefully their speech will improve. So it's, this, this virtual world's not targeted at everybody with aphasia. Yeah. Uh, so your site was obviously bespoke for people with aphasia. Yes. Have you got any first steps on how you would go about making an accessible version of a site that's for everyone? Okay, so I think one of the... You mean for everyone, not just people with aphasia? Yeah, yeah. so you've got a site that you can make it accessible to people with language difficulty. Okay, so I think one of the first things to do is to look at something like the Stroke Association's guidelines on how to make content accessible. And, and as I said, they've got some really brilliant guide, very specific guidelines and some great examples in, in that publication. And then um, what I think we're starting to see, both from our work and from some other work, is people uh, trying to develop interaction design guidelines for people with aphasia. And that, that's something that we're hoping to develop further in the future. And the insights that we've gained about things like the importance of direct mappings from sort of physical actions with input devices to an action happening on a site or in a world are really, uh, I think, the first step in that. But I think they're really important uh, insights into moving away from just thinking about content to thinking about accessible interaction. Um.